All right, gentlemen, good morning. It is Tuesday, 6.30 Central Standard Time, which means it's time for some Bible study. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, but let me warn you, we're going to be all over the map. We're going to go from Genesis all the way through the New Testament today. Today, whether you realize it or not, hopefully this will be a self-fulfilled prophecy, uh, you have come or you are watching via online on a very opportunistic day. In fact, today is one of those Bible studies uh, that even though I'm not a morning person, I get excited about because I believe that today, if you can get what the Bible's saying today, it solves a multitude of problems, a multitude of issues in life. Now, I don't know what you think, but I think we got some issues going on in the world. You think we got some problems? Uh, literally and proverbially, the world is burning right now around us. And there are all kinds of issues and all kinds of struggles and disagreements. And this is humanity with humanity, people with people, society with societies, all kinds of crazy things that are going on. And yet, at the end of the day, humanity's having problems with themselves and with each other. And if you were to ask somebody to even define what is a human being, most people can't define it properly. Now, just for the sake of entertainment, I went to good old Webster last night, and I put in the word human for the definition. You know what it said? A person. So then I went and put person. You know what it said? Human. Even our best resource to define terms doesn't give us very much specifics, does it not? Now, today, from the Bible, we're going to discover how does the Bible define a human being. And how the Bible defines a human being determines how we respond as human beings, not only to ourselves, but to each other. Now, we're going to start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. For those of you who weren't with us last week, Remember, 25% of the book of 1 Thessalonians, the first letter of the Apostle Paul that we've received, chronologically, is about the second coming. Knowing the fact that at any moment, any day, uh, the Lord could call us in the air to be with him. Now, I don't know what your world's like, but at least in my world, I'm getting a whole lot of questions about end times, end of the world scenarios. I even went to the gym last night with my boys and got caught by somebody in the community, does not go to First Baptist Opelika, who we had a 15 minute discussion on the signs of the times, the end of the world, the book of Revelation, right there between the bench press and the squat rack. I mean, I mean, it's just life now. So we get home and you know, boys are inquisitive. Like dad, can, can we talk about what you and that guy were talking about? And so again, it just kind of unfolds itself at home. These are just issues people are interested in because you look around you, it's pretty simple. Well, 25% about the second coming, but chapter five ends with this list of almost a how do. How do you live life knowing that at any moment the Lord could call us to be with him? You know, and it talks about praying at all times, not quenching the spirit, uh, rejoicing, all these different things. But when you get to verse 23, there is this nugget in scripture. I, it, in fact, this is one of those verses, today's one of those lessons that when I first grasped this, it changed everything about how I viewed the world. Verse 23. It says, in the very God of peace, sanctify you holy. I pray, God, that your whole spirit, your soul, and your body be preserved blameless in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that sounds like a simple salutation, does it not? You know, just like God bless and, and have a great day. I just pray your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Seems very simple. Seems like something the Apostle Paul would write at the end of any of his letters. But when you begin to dissect it and look at it introspectively, the Lord has given us something here that even the brightest of humanity can't seem to figure out. The dictionary can't even tell us what a human being is. It says it's a person. You look up a person, it tells us it's a human. But according to this, it says that each and every one of you, every person that you know, every person that we come into contact with, in fact, all seven point, currently seven billion people on the planet have a spirit, a soul, and a body. That's who we are. That's what we're made of. That's how we've been created, and that is how we're fashioned. Now, why is this important? Then we're going to go back in the book of Genesis. The reason it is important is because if you have a problem, the source of help that you go for your problem is going to come from their perspective. Now, understand, today, I'm not here to belittle any field of expertise because I... I I always consult those that are smarter than me in respective fields. But in regards to today's understanding, if you have a medical issue, a medical issue, okay, they always are going to address the fact that the problem's in your body, right? 
What if you have a spiritual issue? Too bad. They're still going to give you a prescription, right? In other words, sometimes your sickness is not fleshly. Sometimes it's a spiritual illness that is manifesting in the flesh. But the medical community as a whole sees it as a body, a fleshly issue. You think we got some issues going on with humanity today? The social scientists, when you address them, they're always going to address it from an emotional perspective, a reactive perspective. Psychologists are always going to look at this historical perspective. Nothing wrong with any of those fields. The problem is that if you do not begin with what is a human being, then you cannot solve a human being's problem. Whether it's a problem with another human being, a problem with a physical illness, an addiction, whatever it may be. So if you try to solve humanity's problem and you don't even know what a human is, how are you going to solve the problem? Today, do we have some problems? We've got a lot of them, don't we? I mean, it, it's just saturated. And I don't know about you, but I wake up every day going, okay, what's the next crisis? I mean, what's the next issue? You know, I'm, I'm actually saying, Lord, could you bring the murder hornets back? I mean, that actually looked good. Uh, compared to some of this mess we're walking through. That being said, if you and I can understand what the Bible is saying here, then it doesn't matter what the issue is, we can understand how to, quote, solve it. So we're going to ask some very important questions. By the way, the outline, we're not handing them out physically here on campus due to COVID-19 and all that mess, is found on our Facebook page. We have broadcast it there live. We're going to address three important questions. First question is this, where did humanity come from? The second question is, what went wrong? And the third question is, how do we fix it? Now, I know that sounds very basic. You're saying you're going to solve all that in 45 minutes. We're actually going to solve those issues in about 10 minutes. And then we're going to come back and explain it all. So we got to go all the way back to the book of Genesis, boys. We're going to go back to where God established us, formed us, created us. And we're not so much looking at the process, although we know the process therein is I want you to see the specific words that God uses to describe our relationship to him and in just a moment our relationship to each other. Very famous passage of scripture, Genesis chapter 1, what we know is the sixth day of creation. All the animals have been created, all the, you know, the water, the land, all that stuff. You get to verse 26. It says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now in today's very pluralistic society, we tend to focus on verse 27 and a lot of Matthew chapter 19 that we're created male, we're created female. But back it up to verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now today, in light of uh, the horrific activities that uh, took place a week ago that have been responded uh, to over the course of the last several evenings, one of the things that we've heard is that the tragedy, the loss of life, whether by means that took place in Minneapolis some days ago or at any occasion, is we've heard people say, well, that individual or an individual, they bear the image of God, okay? Well, right here, this is humanity saying that we were made, we were created in the image of God. Our construction, what we're made of, is in the similitude of God. We're in his image, right? If you make an image of something, you replicate it, correct? All right? If you take a picture, what's the purpose of the picture? To give you the image of whatever the item was. Well, as you study the scripture, we find out there's only one God, right? There's only one God. There's only one of you, correct? I mean, we can try to clone you all day long, but there's one of you, there's one of him. But the Bible says that he is Father, he is Son, and he is Holy Spirit. That he manifests himself, he demonstrates himself in three very clear, distinct means, yet that does not change his unity and his oneness. Now, what did we just read in 1 Thessalonians 5.23? That you have a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a body. Does it not make sense that if there is a single one God who manifests himself in three distinct aspects, that you as an individual have three distinct aspects. You have a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a body. By the way, the Holy Spirit to the spirit within you, that's easy to parallel, right? The body, the body is that which is visible, Jesus Christ with the incarnation, the visibility of God, and then there's the soul that would replicate the Father. So we have the image of God, 
Every human being created, every human being form is in the image of God in the sense that you're constructed just as God is. But then it says, after our likeness. What does that mean? That means that how God constructed you will produce the actions and the endeavors as, as I guess, naturally replicated out of that. So how we're made determines on what we do. If we're in the image of God, we're going to behave like God. If we're constructed as God, we're going to live as God. And the last time I checked in Genesis 1 and 2, in the first part of chapter 3, we didn't do too bad, did we? I mean, humanity, I mean, we're going about our merry way. We're walking in the Garden of Eden. Adam's naming all the animals. It's found no help meet for him. Eve comes. We have all these things, all right? But by the time you get to the middle of chapter 3, so things go sideways, do they not? I mean, real quickly. Adam and Eve sin. We're not going to get into all the sin aspects of, of the guard, but they do sin. As soon as they exit the garden, everything falls apart. Chapter 4, you got your first incident on human-on-human -human violence. Isn't that interesting? Everything we're seeing in the news, everything that's literally lighting up the streets today, started in Genesis 4. Humanity taking the life of another human being. Here's the thing. There's only four people on the planet. I mean, it's not like you had a mob mentality. You know, today, as, as we're seeing what we're seeing, particularly in the evening, we're seeing humanity gathered in large numbers. And when they gather in large numbers, mob mentalities take over. There's only four people. And yet there's this violence. There's this taking of a life. And, and so by the time you get out of the garden, have a couple kids, we have a small microcosm of what you and I watch on the news every night today. Why is that critical? Because that means the issues and the problems that you and I struggle with every day are the same issues we've had since we left the garden. Same issues, same problems, and here's the key, means the same solutions. Whatever should solve that problem should solve ours as well. But I want you to turn over to Genesis chapter 5. And I want to address the question, what happened? We could get into all the details of the garden, even Cain and Abel and all that mess. But in Genesis chapter 5, we see something happening that I think is critical to our understanding of the world around us and particularly in humanity today. Beginning in verse one, it says, this is the book. In other words, we're about to have a genealogy here of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him, male and female created he them, blessed them, called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Now that's back to what we just read in chapter one. Everything was great, right? Look at verse three. And Adam lived 130 years, begat a son, in his own likeness, in his image, and called him Seth. Now, there's two things I want you to notice there. The first is the personal pronoun. Does it say that Seth was born in the image of God? It does not. It says he was born in the image of who? Seth. Or, I mean, Seth, born in the image of Adam. Seth is born in the image of Adam. Number two, you notice that the words likeness and image are reversed. Humanity was created in the image of God after the likeness of God. Seth was born in the likeness of Adam after the image of Adam. In other words, if we go back to the Garden of Eden, humanity was born, was constructed as God and then had a life that replicated it. You and I, we come out of the womb, we come into existence behaving just like our parents, do we not? Now, I don't know about in your home, but at least in mine, when my kids mess up, typically I hear, well, they're your children. I'm like, as if I'm the only one that had anything to do with this. But nonetheless, we understand that that's somewhat of a humor. So therefore, according to Genesis chapter 5, since the fall, humanity comes out behaving just like their parents. That's what the likeness is. That's the mannerisms. After the likeness of Adam, created in the image of Adam. In other words, the way we now behave as a fallen human being determines our construction. Now, I want you to just hold on for that just a minute. That means that back before sin entered the world, we were constructed in the image of God, which then produced a behavior that looked like God. Now, when a child is born, they exhibit behavior that looks like fallen humanity that then in turn creates a construction that is different than the original construction of humanity. Now, 
You may be having those little bubbles popping up in questions. Hopefully, I'll address those in just a moment. But I want to dig into that this morning because according to the scripture, it says that Seth was born in the likeness of Adam and after his image. The words are reversed and the personal pronoun is exchanged. Now, the third question is, so how do you fix it? If we've got a problem that we behave just like our parents and it changes our construction, how do we solve this issue? Go to the book of Colossians chapter 2, all the way to the New Testament. I warned you in advance. We're going to go all over the Bible. Colossians chapter 2 is the key. This verse, if we can kind of grasp this, will change the way you watch the news. It will change the way you interact with humanity. And then we're going to unpack it all. I told you it wasn't even going to take 45 minutes. 10-minute Bible study. It's much like a dissertation. If you've ever read a dissertation, first five pages tell you everything you need to know. The other 300 pages are just proving it's true. Okay, so I'm going to tell you what you need to know, then we're going to prove it's true. In the book of Colossians, chapter 2, obviously written to believers in Jesus Christ, obviously uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but given through the person of who we know as the Apostle Paul. I'll go ahead and begin in verse 10 just for the sake of uh, continuity. It says, uh, you are complete in him, that's Christ Jesus, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you, now these are believers in Jesus Christ, you are circumcised. Now, push pause there. We're in a men's Bible study, right? So we can be, we understand what that is, do we not? It's a cutting of the what? Flesh. All right. Now, some of you have heard this humorous story in the past. If you have, just, you know, put up with me for a moment. You know, we have three boys. Obviously, that is a uh, medical procedure that has happened, in, in, not in our home, but in our lives. You know, in the Old Testament, they did it on the eighth day. And there's a lot of medical reasons that have been, you know, to justify, you know, with the white blood cells and all, all the, the medical research there. I wanted to be biblical. I wanted my first son to be circumcised on the eighth day, just like they did in the Bible. If you do it in the Bible, it must be the right way to do it, right? Well, the um, obstetrician, she, you know, argued with me and said, well, that can't happen. And we've got to do it here on the second day. And I said, well, I want to wait on the eighth day. She said, well, okay, that's fine. You can wait on the eighth day but he's not leaving the hospital and the insurance isn't going to cover days three through eight. And I said, go ahead and do it. Um, <laughs> amazing how economics can trump theology real quick. But nonetheless, says, but we understand what circumcision is. Circumcision is a cutting of the flesh. Notice what it says. That the circumcision made without hands, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Now, folks, we can unpack that for hours. The word circumcision is used three times in one verse. I think God wants us to get the image, does he not? All right, and we know what that is. It's a cutting of the flesh, except here it says without hands. What does that circumcision, what does that cutting do? It puts off the body of the sins of the flesh. In other words, humanity's sin problem, humanity's issues have to deal with this flesh that we're covered in. This is our problem. And what needs to happen? Humanity needs a good old fashioned circumcision. Now, don't take that literally as a medical procedure. What we need is our flesh that has the tendency to do all types of ill behavior, make all types of wrong decisions. It needs to be removed from us, okay? Do you find it interesting that in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says there's coming a day where the dead in Christ and the alive in Christ will meet together in the air with Christ. Do we get a new soul at that day? No. Do we get a new spirit? No. What do we get? We get a new body. So guess what the problem is? That nasty, ugly thing that looks at you in the mirror every morning. That's your problem. But here's the main issue. Has that flesh, has that body been circumcised? And I'm not talking medical procedure, men. I'm talking a spiritual procedure. It says this is done without hands, putting off the sins of the flesh of the body. So in other words, when we see people make decisions they shouldn't make, do things they shouldn't do, or uh, I guess enact behavior that we know is erroneous according to our creator, well, at the end of the day, the problem is that they haven't had a spiritual circumcision. They have not had a time in their life where the sins of their flesh have been, quote, circumcised or cut. Now, I'm going to unpack all that. We'll come back full circle. I hope and promise it'll make sense. So who are you? 
Sounds like an elementary question, right? If I were to ask you 20 minutes ago, who are you? You'd say, I'm a human being. Well, the problem is even the dictionary doesn't know that. So when I say, who are you? You are a spirit, you are a soul, and you are a body. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. That's who you are. It doesn't matter the height of your body. That's who you are. It doesn't, it doesn't even matter the width. You know, our, our new children's pastor here, Paul Dunbar, his joke with me is we're cut out of the same cloth. He got twice as much material. Uh, he's a large man, all right? But even though he is literally twice the size I am, doesn't change the fact that he has a body, a soul, and a spirit, and I have a body, a soul, and a spirit. That's who you are. But according to 1 Thessalonians 5, it began with spirit. Now, if you were to go back in the book of Genesis, remember the Bible says that God takes the dirt of the ground, this red clay. By the way, it's proof the Garden of Eden's from Alabama. If you didn't know. Adam means red clay. So here we go. Takes this red clay, forms Adam. Do you remember what happens when God breathes? The Bible says when he breathes in him, this is Genesis 2, he becomes a living soul. That means somebody without the Spirit of God is a what? A dead soul. But they have a body, do they not? He formed Adam. He was there. I mean, it would look like, in my opinion, it would look like a corpse in a morgue. You have a body. You have a soul. But there's no life there. He breathed into him, and the Bible says he became a living soul. So if somebody does not have the Spirit of God moving in their life, what are they? They're a dead they're, they're a dead man walking is literally what they are, which is funny because we have TV shows now called Dead Men Walking. Funny how we keep going back to the Bible and not even realizing it. All right, so let's talk about the Spirit for just a moment. And for the sake of time, I'm going to allude to a lot of these verses rather than us turning to them. I wanted you to read what we did in Genesis, but they're on the outline. If you don't have a copy with you today, you can go back and, and look at them. So in Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 says that we, before we knew Christ, before we were saved... We were dead in our trespasses and in our sins. And it talks about the, the spirit of the power of the air, who's a reference to Satan, worked within us the spirit of disobedience. Now, this is where I get in a whole lot of hot water with folks. So just calm down and work with me because I understand when somebody in a public forum talks about someone who senselessly loses their life or someone who uh, receives great tragedy at the hands of another person, they'll say, how could we do this to somebody who is in the image of God? I know what they mean, but theologically there's a problem there. And this is where I get in hot water. I have three children in my home. None of them were born in the image of God. None of them. They were born in the likeness of Jeff. They came out, what was their first word? No. Think about that. Those of you that have got children, and I know some of you grandparents, and you get, I don't know what happens, and, and I guess it'll happen to me in a few years. When you get a jam, when you become a grandparent, you have this genetic disorder where all of a sudden everything you disciplined in the past, you celebrate now. I don't know how that works, but I'm looking forward to it, to be honest with you. Best statement I ever heard about having grandkids. Somebody said it's the reward for not killing your own. That was a pretty good statement. But, you know, everybody talks, and I understand because I want you to know, I'm, I'm a defender of life. In other words, for those of you who may not know, we have a, a women's clinic uh, in our community uh, that seeks uh, to provide services for women who maybe are contemplating ending the life that is in their womb, okay? They counsel with them. They do sonogram. My wife and I, I don't mind saying this on the, on the web, we contribute financially every month to that ministry in addition to what we do here at First Baptist Hope Life. Why? Because it's that important. Okay, But even though I am an ardent supporter of life, I'm a defender of life, every child that is born, even you, I hate to tell you guys, even you, you weren't born in the image of God because you were born with a sinful disposition. Now, let me backtrack a minute. I understand when somebody says that we as humanity are in the image of God. I know what they're trying to say. But if you really break it down, according to Ephesians 2, when you came into this world, what did you have inside of you? The spirit of what? Disobedience. Don't believe me? Just get around a preschooler. It's real easy to see. That's who we are. If parents don't discipline, what happens? It goes sideways, right? Our natural disposition is not to worship God. Our natural disposition is give me mine and give it now. 
the first thing we do when we come into the world is what? Cry. It's the first thing we do, right? We're cold. We're hungry. We're hot. We're th- whatever it may be. And here's the problem. The first 12 months of life, they can't even communicate what it is. But it doesn't stop them from hollering and screaming, does it? Then once we get in these formative stages, then we become teenagers. And, well, y'all know where that goes. But nonetheless, when I make the statement, humans are no longer born in the image of God, I'm not making an observational statement. I'm making a theological statement that a human being is born with the likeness of their parents, the image of their parents, and you can blame it all the way back to Adam if you want to. Go back to 1 Corinthians 15 where it says, In Adam all what? Die. Every human being born on the planet who does not get saved dies and spends an eternity in hell. So you tell me we're born in the image of God. How can you be born in the image of God if your destination is hell? God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Go back to Genesis chapter 5. What happened? Seth was born in the likeness of Adam, in the image of Adam. Guess what, guys? We got a problem from the very first breath we breathe. We have a disposition of depravity. We are no longer born in the image of God theologically. Humans become in the image of God through Jesus Christ. So if we want to truly be one who represents the image, the likeness, and the behavior of God, we have to get saved. That's what the Bible says. John chapter 1, verse 12. Those who believe in Jesus become the what? Sons of God. In other words, if we want to act like God, if we want to be constructed like God, and I'm using generic terms there, then we have to be his child, correct? There's a reason my children are short and thick because they're after me. I mean, that's how we're constructed in the Myers home. Now, I know some of y'all don't believe this. I'm grateful. I'm the tallest man in the Myers family. Well, now my children are taller than me. Thank God. Um, But people, you know, when you talk, why do your kids look like you? You know, why? Because how many times have you come across somebody, you finally figure out who they are, and you go, you look just like your daddy, or you look just like your mama. We've all said that, right? In other words, What we understand is we all come in with that likeness and image of our parents. When we become the image of God, when we get saved, guess what? We now can, for the very first time, exhibit God-like traits. Holiness, righteousness, forgiveness, temperance. Do we need some of that in our culture today? Guess what? What you're seeing on TV every night is just a natural consequence to the way humanity comes out of the womb. And unless something intervenes, why would we expect any different? You can rehabilitate. You can uh, place them in confined areas. But it's temporary because you haven't changed who they are. All you've done is change their environment. All you've done is change maybe the words they would say to appease you, whatever it may be. And for those of you that are in law enforcement, how many people just prefer probation make all kinds of false statements because they know what you want to hear? They haven't changed. Humanity doesn't change until humanity gets saved. What did it say in Colossians 2? Putting off the sins of the flesh. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Who's he talking to? Christians. He's talking to believers. So, hypothetically, got two people. One of them's lost, one of them's saved. The one who is lost has the spirit, according to Ephesians 2, of what? Disobedience. So why would we expect humanity to obey any laws, any rules, or anything we put in place? It's not not their natural disposition. Your natural from-the-womb disposition is to find a way to disobey any authority that's put in your life. That's who you are. But when you get saved, you now have the Spirit of God. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love. That's the first. Oh, my. I mean, this is revolutionary, guys. How many times have you heard someone in the last few days on television say, we just need to love each other? That's a great statement, right? But you can't really do it until you're saved. You can't really care about somebody else more than yourself, which is, by the way, that's what love means, until you get saved. So we're asking people right now, I mean, this, I mean I'm just going to go, we're asking people right now to love people that they may have not loved in days past. They can't do it until they're saved. 
They don't have the capacity. Why? They have the spirit of disobedience in them. Now, they may tell you what you want to hear to get you to be appeased, but they don't have the capacity to do it because they don't have the spirit of God in them. They have the spirit of disobedience. We are dead in our trespasses, our sins. Everything about humanity is contrary to God until we get saved. Then we have love, joy. Oh, what's that third one, guys? Peace. Have you heard that word enough times lately? Everybody wants peace, right? I said it Sunday. I'm going to say it again. You cannot have peace with another, hu another human being until you have peace with God. It's not going to happen. It is not going to happen. Some of you guys that remember the last time that um, the streets looked like they did today, back in the 60s, what was the big statement? Make peace. Peace. Peace everywhere. Remember Nixon's famous, you know, peace signs coming out? How many times do we talk about peace? A lot, right? How often do we get it? We don't. You've seen it and I've seen it. People who were arch enemies who come to know Jesus all of a sudden now are dear friends. How does that work? It's the peace of God. It only comes by the spirit of God. So at the end of the day, when you look at humanity and we're having troubles with each other, which we are not just today, but in all times at the core of who you are, when you see somebody walk in the street, they are either, they are either living by or have within them the power or the depravity of humanity or the spirit of God. That's your only two choices. One of the great stories of years ago was told by D.L. Moody, the great evangelist. Uh, he had a friend of his that was a pastor, and this pastor called him in, and it was, in, you know, it was there in London. It was a large city, obviously. And he said, I don't understand. We're in this huge city with all these people. And the church I pastor, we're making little to no difference. We're not reaching anybody. It's just, it, I don't know what's wrong. So D.L. Moody said, I can solve this. Let me come by your house. He went over, and of course, it was a very urban environment, what we'd call kind of a townhome, you know, apartment in a big city. Looked over the balcony. He said, tell me what you see. He said, what do you mean? He said, just look at the street. Tell, tell me what you see. And he said, well, I see a, a young lady pushing her baby in a stroller. I see a man that looks like he's late for a meeting. He's, he's running in a suit. He began to describe the scene. He said, that's your problem. He said, what do you mean? He said, let me tell you what I see. He said, I see a person. I wonder, is that person going to heaven or hell? I see another person. I say, I wonder if that person's headed to heaven or hell. And what he was saying is, when you see humanity, they either have the spirit of disobedience or they have the spirit of God. There's no other choice. And so when we see behavior that exhibits a sinfulness, then there's a pretty good chance that they've got the spirit of disobedience in them. Now, don't get me wrong. Christians can mess up. I got that. That's not for today. But when you look at what you're seeing in the world today, and people say things that don't make sense. They do things that are destructive. They exhibit hate, racism, whatever it may be. Guess what? It's called the spirit of disobedience. And we're not going to solve it by throwing money at it. We're not going to solve it by bringing in the National Guard. You know how you saw? You know what? I know, by the way, I say this all the time. I know I would never get elected to office. I would never run for office. Because if I did, my wife, well, that'd be a whole other story. You know how to solve this problem? You need to send in a team of evangelists. That's what you need to do. Because when people recognize that they have a sin problem and they replace the spirit of disobedience with the spirit of God in their life, now you've got a chance. Now you've got a chance. Now you've got an opportunity for two people who were taught their whole life to hate each other because of how they look in the mirror to actually be brothers. Because they are brothers. They're brothers in Christ. Doesn't matter what their skin color is. And so, therefore, it's the spirit that gives the life of a human being. And so, you either have a spirit of disobedience or you have the spirit of God. There's no other third option. All right? Let's talk about the soul for just a moment. When we talk about the soul, that's that part, remember we described earlier, that's hard to see, can't see. It's kind of intangible, like the Father in that paradigm of the Trinity. Two passages here. Luke chapter 16, famous story of the rich man and Lazarus. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go into all the details there. Revelation chapter 6 talks about these souls under the altar of God uh, in the heavens crying out. I want you to just hear, and by the way, I put the scriptures beside these descriptions on the outline. I want you to hear what the Bible says about a soul. All right. Now, the rich man, according to the Bible, is in hell. All right. In Revelation chapter 6, it says these individuals are in the altar of God or under the altar of God in the heavens. So you have people that have left earth as far as a human existence are in either in heaven or hell. Right? Notice this, that a soul can see. A soul can see. Lazarus looked up and he saw Abraham. He had the capacity to visually see what was going on around him. A soul can speak. 
Lazarus called Abraham and said, if somebody from the dead were to go visit my brothers, remember the conversation he has with Abraham there in Luke chapter 16? In Revelation chapter 6, the souls under the altar cry out to God. They voice God, how long until you avenge our death? A soul can see, a soul can speak. Did you know that a soul has appendages? You say, what do you mean a soul has appendages? Lazarus says, I want to dip my finger in a cup of cold water. It says that the souls in Revelation 6 bowed on their knees. Isn't that interesting? When we talk about somebody's soul, don't we kind of get this idea of a blob? Mm -mm. No. In fact, I've talked to people, and I'm not in the medical community, and I know there's those that are here that are experts in this, so I don't want to go too far. But I've talked to individuals who have had their legs amputated, diabetes, tragic car wreck, whatever it may be, who years later say that they at times feel their toes itch. Now, I know what a psychologist would say. I get it. A psychologist would say, well, that's the memories of, and they go through all this explanation. I can tell you what it is. That person has a soul, all right? And even though a physical leg may be missing, part of their soul didn't get cut off. Lazarus dips his finger in a cup of coal, or he desires to. A soul can wear clothing. That's important. Because in Revelation 6, it says they were wearing robes. That means you're wearing clothing right now. I'm not talking about the shirt. You're wearing flesh, aren't you? Your soul has clothing on it right now. A soul can feel. Lazarus says that he is tormented in this fire, in this heat. A soul can remember. You remember Lazarus talked about his brothers. How is he in hell and knows about his family? Because he remembers he had brothers. Last but not least, a soul can pray. Lazarus cried out to God. And the, the souls under the altar, they cried out to God. Why is that important? Because your soul, and, and I hate to use this phrase, it's a bad word, but I'm using, it's kind of the benign aspect here, okay? When the Apostle Paul talks about the old man and the new man, what he's talking about is that battle between your flesh and between the Spirit of God. Your soul is, has an eternal destination. It's either going to heaven or hell, all right? And it's going to feel, it's going to see, it's going to experience and based on the spirit of disobedience would send somebody to hell, the spirit of God which send somebody to heaven determines where your soul goes. The key, though, is the body. That's what's key. All right? That's what we need to understand because every word that you hear today that is a curt word, we hear in the flesh. All right? Every action that is done, we see in the flesh. I already talked about Colossians chapter uh, 2, verse 11. It talks about that we are circumcised. So what does this mean? Now, again... That means that, and I'm going to use myself as an example, all right? That means that I came out of the womb and I came out bad, all right? I acted like my parents. I spoke like my parents, humanity in general. My first word was probably no. I mean, it probably was. And I can look back and I, as you, had my fair share of bad behavior. But there was a time in my life where I got saved. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean I started going to church? No. Does that mean I started buying Bibles? No. That means there came a time where I realized that I had a sin problem. Now, I don't know if you can remember back to the day you got saved, but I remember. I realized, even as a young child, that if things didn't change, it wasn't going to look good in the future. I realized I was headed to hell and I deserved every bit of it. That's the key part. I deserved it. All right? When I realized I had a sin problem and that going to church couldn't solve it, reading the Bible couldn't solve it, being friends with so-and-so couldn't solve it, that only Jesus could solve it, I asked him to save me. And when he saved me, something happened. You say, well, what happened? Did you get goosebumps? I didn't get goosebumps. You know, I ask people all the time to get saved. I said, do you feel different? You know, they're scared to tell me no. They're scared to. Because we have this mindset that we get this glowing all over our body or we feel like we can levitate. I didn't feel any different, okay? But something did change. According to what we just read today, my flesh had a supernatural circumcision. And the body that I now wear, I will not wear for all of eternity. I'm going to get a new one. Did I get a new soul? Mm -mm. Did I get a new spirit? You bet I did. Because the spirit of disobedience got replaced with the spirit of God. So in other words, here's the thing I want you to hear. I was born, I'm a, he's not here this morning, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to utilize my dad. Okay, I was born in the likeness of Ron Myers. And because of that... I was born in the image of him in humanity. By the way, my sons were to me as well, all right? I acted bad, I spoke bad, I thought bad. 
It's who I was. It's who humanity is. I could not exhibit God-like behavior, righteous behavior, or holy behavior until this flesh got cut off my soul. I had to have a surgical procedure. Now, I know there's medical professionals that are watching, listening in the room. You're saying, you mean you're telling me your body was stuck to your soul? According to the Bible. According to the Bible, my body was stuck to my soul, which means that my soul was tainted, sinful, and nasty. But when I got saved, my body got cut off. And now my soul can one day enter into the presence of God. My soul now has the capacity to go and to do and to be as God originally created humanity to do. See, that's the key here of understanding that the problems that we're seeing and we're hearing and that we're seeing in life, the problem is we got a lot of folks whose sinful, natural body is stuck to them and they need a good old God surgery is what they need. Everybody, now I know the hospital just opened up for elective surgeries. Humanity needs one big mass surgical operation right now. We need our flesh, the sins of the flesh, what it called at First Thessalonians, we need it replaced. We need it cut away from us. We need it removed from us. In fact, the Bible says, and I'll close with this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, one day we will look and we will be as him, speaking of Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Why do we study all this? Because according to 1 Thessalonians 5.23, every human being has a spirit, a soul, and a body. The question is, whose likeness and whose image are they in? And until you know Jesus as your Savior, your disposition is going to be toward depravity and destruction. Once you get saved, your inclination now has the capacity to be for love, joy, peace, temperance, and I could go on. The behaviors that we despise, the behaviors that we bemoan, cannot be solved by having convocations. They cannot be solved uh, by having rallies. They cannot be solved uh, by having peace accords. They can only be solved because every human being, who by the way, I want you to hear me clearly, I believe every human being has value or I wouldn't give money toward an agency that tries to preserve every human being in the womb. They have value because they have the capacity to exhibit the traits of their creator when they come to know their creator through Jesus Christ. Every human being has value. Don't hear me wrong. But until a person knows Jesus, they don't have the capacity to be and to do and to act and to decide that which is righteous and holy. And so at the end of the day, what we're seeing in our world it's a human problem that only God can solve. And until we call on God to solve it, folks, we're just wasting time, money, and a whole lot of energy out there. If I were in charge, and I'm not, on every major city we got in America, I would unload a truckload of evangelists with Bibles, and I'd hit the streets. Because until people admit they got a sin problem, and until people admit they need Jesus, folks, we're not going to have peace. We're not going to have camaraderie. We're not going to have understanding, and we're going to keep repeating the same mistakes and problems each successive generation. The solution is not more education. We got enough of that. The solution is not more of this or more of that. The solution is we are in the likeness of our parents, we're in the image of our parents, and we need to now be in the image and the likeness of God. And the only way that can happen is when this flesh is circumcised and it only happens through jesus christ now i know that's a simple elementary answer jesus is the solution i wanted you to see this morning i think this is a critical piece to understanding everything that's going on with humanity not just this day but every day when you come to an understanding this is hard for us that we're born bad and we can only quote become good through jesus then we understand why we have the problems we do and when we understand what needs to happen when you as a Christian, when you as a Christian fall into temptation, you know what has happened? You listen to your flesh. That's what you did. You didn't listen to the Spirit of God. There's a warfare, right? There's a battle going on between what the Spirit of God is leading you to do and what your flesh wants to touch, do, or experience, right? Did you know for a lost person there's not a battle going on? There's not a battle at all. 
Because the spirit of disobedience is only coming into conjunction with the flesh that's tainted. There's no struggle. Have you ever uh, talked about somebody, and I know we got to wrap up, and you said, it just seems like they have no conscience. Well, you can say that all you want, but what it really means is their flesh and their spirit are in agreement toward depravity, is what it means. But when you have the spirit of God in you, and your flesh does something it shouldn't do, what happens? Conviction. You're torn about it, right? You're bothered by it. Because you know that your body didn't do what the Spirit of God told you to do. But when you're lost, all your body is doing exactly what the Spirit inside of you is telling you to do. And there, my friends, 45 minutes. You understand what's going on around the world today. What we need is a whole lot of Jesus. What we're propagating is a whole lot of everything else. And if we keep doing what we've been doing, guess what? We're going to keep getting what we've been getting. And it's just going to be of a different mindset, whatever it is, in a successive generation. So, gentlemen, as we wrap up today, please understand, if you want all this mess to stop, we need a good old dose of Jesus. If we don't get a good dose of Jesus, it's just going to keep on rolling and keep on going. Now you understand how we're made up and why it happens. All right, let's roll out of here. We'll see you all next week.